Hello, good evening. Welcome to Northwest Tonight. I'm Roger Johnson. Thanks for joining us. Our top story. Emergency services spend the day at Barrow's nuclear submarine shipyard after fire breaks out in the construction hall. Officials say there was no nuclear risk from the blaze. Also tonight, the man accused of the Southport stabbings appears in court as a political row breaks out over the handling of the case. Included in the budget, the re-announcement of several infrastructure projects on roads, rails and hospitals. Taking off, we'll meet the young Mancunian rally star on the road to taking on the world. <laughs> Nightmares of the Round Table. How the former Camelot theme park has been turned into a Halloween horror show. And low cloud has been very stubborn today, leading to quite poor visibility and some drizzle in places. Join me at the end of the programme for a full live forecast to see if tomorrow is looking any brighter. Engineers at BAE Systems are tonight assessing the damage to its nuclear submarine shipyard in Barrow after what was described as a significant fire last night. It broke out in the Devonshire Dock Hall, where Britain's nuclear submarines are built, and the largest indoor shipyard of its kind in Europe. Two workers were taken to hospital, and police say there was no nuclear risk. Well, let's go live to Phil Cunliffe. He spent the day in Barrow for us. He's still there tonight. Phil, what's the very latest? Well, at the moment, there, there's no sign of any smoke. There is no outward signs of any damage to that ginormous building behind me, the Devonshire Dock Hall, as you say. Fire broke out there, though, about 1 o'clock this morning, uh, sending black smoke billowing into the atmosphere. The police arrived quickly on the scene. In fact, there were 70 firefighters here tackling the blaze. People were told to stay indoors and keep their windows closed. Now, police also say that two people, two workers, in fact, were sent to hospital um, after they breathed in uh, the effects of the smoke, but thankfully they were released from hospital a little later. And in fact, everyone that was working in that dock hall area last night in, in this shipyard was safely accounted for. And Phil, it's a hugely important building for Britain's nuclear submarine programme. It certainly is, yeah. This is the only place in, in the UK where they build submarines. And, in fact, in the last month, we've seen uh, six out of the, the, six out of the seven um, astute-class vessels launched into service by BAE Systems. And, of course, they're still building the Dreadnought-class of, of vessel as well. And then there's a contract in place for submarines to be sent to Australia. So it's a very important place. Thousands of people work here, and they are nuclear-powered submarines. Now, nuclear and fire would suggest, you know, would send alarm bells ringing. But BAE Systems and the Ministry of Defence moved very quickly this morning to reassure people that this area is safe despite the fire and that there is no nuclear risk. And what does it mean for uh, production of the, of the subs? Will, will the building programme be affected, Phil? Well, investigations are continuing into what started this fire and the extent of the damage. The local MP says that she's being kept informed. It's our biggest employer, so it's one in three working there. It's, it's, it's huge for Barrow and Furness, but at this point, um, I, I don't actually think it would, be, it would be right to speculate on what's happening in there. They are working on it right now. We're being updated on a, a regular basis with both BAE systems and ministers, so we're, we're, in, we're in discussions with them. But while the teams are still in there assessing it, it's, it's much too early to say. Well, of course, a lot of the workers I've spoken to this afternoon weren't able to come on camera because they are subject to uh, confidentiality agreements because they work for the Ministry of Defence. There's a lot of speculation on social media. I've seen one Facebook post today suggesting that inside there it really is a mess. BAE Systems have only told us so far that there was a fire in part of that building behind me, uh, but uh, there is now restricted access to the entire building. But I think, Roger, on reflection, uh, it's safe to say that, you know, thankfully there were no... Um, there were no serious injuries, and it could have been a lot more serious. OK, Phil, thank you very much. Phil Cunliffe there. Now, the Prime Minister's told MPs that they should let police who are investigating the Southport knife attack get on with their jobs. That came as a political row broke out over whether additional charges faced by the teenager who's accused of the murders should have been made public earlier. The suspect appeared in court again today in Westminster. Westminster magistrates, Andy Gill, was uh, across things. He's here. He's got the latest. Andy. 
Thank you, Roger. 18-year-old Axel Rudakabana appeared at Westminster Magistrates Court via video link from prison. He kept the lower half of his face covered and chose to remain silent. He was already charged with three murders and ten attempted murders in relation to the Southport incident. Now he's accused of producing the poison ricin and of possessing a document that could be useful to someone committing or preparing an act of terrorism. These charges come three months after the attack and it's led the two Conservative leadership candidates and others to question whether information has been concealed from the public. The government says it became aware of possible new charges in the past few weeks and the Prime Minister hit back at critics today. All of us in this House have a choice to make, including both candidates, candidates to be the next Tory leader. They can either support the police in their difficult task or they can undermine the police in their difficult task. And I know which side I'm on. Although Mr Rudakabana has now been charged under the Terrorism Act, the Southport stabbings are not being treated as an act of terrorism. That's because it's not clear what any alleged motive may have been in this case. For terrorism, you have to prove that at the time of using or threatening violence, that you were trying to advance a cause. So the, the key test is, were you advancing an ideological, racial, religious or political cause? And it's got to be at the time of you doing the act. Mr Hoare also says new charges may only have come out now because it takes time for police to examine electronic devices. Axel Riddikabana was remanded in custody today. He's due to appear at Liverpool Crown Court next month for a plea hearing. That's when a defendant can admit or deny the charges they face. Roger. Andy, thank you very much. Now, we seem to have been talking about the budget for months. Well, today, it finally happened. Lots of it. National insurance contributions, increases in capital gains and inheritance taxes and a rise in the minimum wage came as no surprise. Rachel Reeves also announced increased spending on public services, some of it funded by increased borrowing. There were also a few specific announcements relating to the North West, some of which had actually been announced ages ago. We were told that rail services between Manchester and Staley Bridge would be electrified. Well... Electric trains are already running. Also, building the long-awaited Mottram Bypass will start next year. That was actually confirmed in July. Carbon capture and storage projects were reconfirmed for Merseyside, as well as a new project for Barrow in Furness. Greater Manchester and the Liverpool City region are to be given more control over how to spend government funding. And the Chancellor also repeated plans to rebuild Leighton Hospital in Crewe after the discovery of crumbling rack concrete. But other hospitals will have to wait. We'll be live in Westminster shortly. But first, this is supposed to be a budget for growth. So what's the view of the pe people who will be responsible for that growth? Businesses, of course. Davinia Ramos has been getting reaction in Liverpool. A big day for a big budget. And for small business owners, a nervous wait to find out what the new Chancellor has in store. We've already seen employment in small businesses going down slightly, but it's just going to exacerbate that. Rachel Reeves announced today that companies will have to pay more national insurance on salaries above £5,000. That's an increase of 1.2%. Previously, the threshold started at £9,100, so this will have a big impact. So I've got to find ways of where do I reduce those costs to balance the business books. And that's it in the simple terms. And there's only one place it's going to be. It's either I increase prices, which makes me uncompetitive, or I start reducing the increases in salary or no increases in salary next year for people. The Chancellor says this huge tax rise, which accounts for £25 billion, would be offset by an increase in employment allowance, which allows smaller companies to reduce their national insurance liability. But there are fears many people will have to think twice about hiring staff. They were going to take on that extra apprentice. Now they're probably not going to. Uh, if someone leaves, they're probably not going to recruit to replace them. And that this will add significant uh, costs. There was some good news for employees. The national minimum wage for over 21s will rise to £12.21 an hour, whilst those aged 18 to 20 will get £10 an hour. But here at this clothes factory in Liverpool, workers still had concerns about whether more staff could be recruited. I'm a single father with two daughters, so, you know, I, I need that sort of reassurance and that stability that I'm here for the, for the long term. And um, we'll, I'd be looking at bringing, you know, 
um, new apprentices in to, to work in this field. Um, I'm hoping that we would be able to do that with the, the minimum living wage going up. I'm just wonder whether the directors of the company or the company as a whole would be in a position to, to be able to take these new apprentices on. Last night, we spoke to Andrew. He says today's budget could have been a lot worse. Now, we've been in business in 28 years. We know that we've got to grow and we've got to find that money in fiscal, and we will, just like the government has to. So it's, a, it's certainly not the business-friendly budget that I personally wanted, but at the same time, I understand that the government have got to... I'd rather them create a stable economy. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Davinia Ramos, BBC Northwest tonight, Liverpool. Well, that, though, the view from uh, some small businesses and some workers. Uh, what do the politicians think? That's not a politician. That's Phil Cunliffe still in Barrow. That is our political editor, Annabel Tiffin. She is live in Westminster with guests. Annabel. I am, Roger. Yes, good evening. Uh, this was Rachel Reeves' first budget. It was Labour's first budget in 14 years. It was also my guests' first budget as MPs, because these are three of our newest MPs. Let's find out what they made of the budget. Tim Rocker, MP for Macclesfield for Labour. Uh, we heard from Liverpool businesses just then. One of them said this wasn't a business-friendly budget. Another said that because of the national insurance increase for employers, they will either have to put prices up for customers or they won't be able to give staff a pay increase. This isn't really the, the, the pound in the pockets budget that was promised, is it? Well, it is a business-friendly budget because it's bringing stability after 14 years of chaos. It's historic. After 14 years, we've got our first Labour budget and we've committed to investing in our public services, making sure that we're getting the country on a sustainably fiscal track and everybody, businesses and workers, will benefit from it. But um, you have tax businesses and the wealthy, so this is not necessarily a business-friendly budget. Well, it? people will know the inheritance that we had from the previous government. Decisions, choices have to be made. We've made ours. They're sensible. They're balanced. If others disagree with them, they've got to set out how they would raise that money or what services they would cut would they cut NHS investment would they cut investment in schools but today we made our choices we're committed to putting the country back on a decent track and rebuilding our public services well Andrew Snowden uh, you are the new MP for filed for the Conservatives Rachel Reeves said that this was a difficult budget but it was a responsible budget unlike the Conservatives mini budget which crashed the economy yeah, and at the end of the day, we are now opposition and we lost the election, but that doesn't necessarily mean that because we got some things wrong that this budget is right, and that's a very, very important point to make. At the end what of the day... What was wrong about it specifically for you? At the end, uh, because we did too much too quickly and... No, um, sorry, this budget, budget. what this was wrong? This particular budget, what's wrong about this is it's basically taxing the hell out of business, which are the people who pay for public services, and effectively between the £40 billion in extra taxes, the near £70 billion in extra borrowing so what's that 110 billion pounds for that we're getting lower growth and higher inflation um, and what we're going to see over the medium to long term is an economy that is dogged by more debt that is dogged by businesses who won't want to invest as, as, as the people who've spoken to you already have rightly said who will be put off um, from investing in this country and what we'll see is that lower growth um, we'll see the economy stagnate and that will damage public services in the long run. Lisa Smart MP Liberal Democrat for Hazel Grove, do you agree with that or do you think that actually some of these decisions may be unpopular but they needed to be taken to get more money for, say, the NHS? So as Liberal Democrats, we've been campaigning throughout the last general election before and we will continue to do so for more money to go into our NHS and social care system. It was encouraging to hear, after a period of instability, to hear some aims towards stability from the Chancellor and that she's heeded some of the Lib Dem cries to invest in our NHS. We, of course, as a constructive opposition, will scrutinise these proposals very carefully. What I'm worried about, though, the elephant in the room for us is social care. There was a small amount of money Carers going to allowance. local government. Carers allowance up. is a step forward and a real win for Ed Davey, who has championed this, both from his own experience but also okay. as an MP, and that is a step forward. It's not nearly far enough. Uh, Tim, you've been shaking your head at, at a lot of what was Well, absolutely. I mean, the OBR, the independent OBR, we know that the Conservative Party doesn't like independent forecasters, but they say that the Chancellor's plans today will add to economic growth by 1.5%. But, of course, we've had a huge inheritance to tackle and deal 
deal with. So we've had to approach things in a balanced and sensible way. And look at the results that we've got today. We're going to see £20 billion pounds plus in our National Health Service helping to bring those waiting lists down. Got another billion pounds. In just, you can't fix the health service unless you really tackle the problem of funding social care. We need cross-party working on this. And rightly, we're talking about growth. If you don't address the issues of our broken relationship with Europe, you cannot be serious in tackling the issue of getting growth in this country. And, that, and that's Very where you briefly. get into the instability point, don't you? Because we're clear that we're about stability and not reopening constitutional questions that Who put the country on a different... That? It's it sounded about our a lot relationship. Like it and on it's carers, about our relationship. lots of Labour MPs were making the case for carers. Right. And that's really great. And they were right. The Chancellor did it. Ed was right. leading from the front. We've run out of time. It's gone very quickly, but thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, yeah, the repercussions will no doubt carry on for many weeks, days, months to come. But uh, if, whether you're celebrating the budget or perhaps even drowning your sorrows, the good news is that the Chancellor did say that she would knock off about, what was it, a pence off a pint of draft beer. So cheers. Back to you, Roger. Yeah, still cost a fortune a pint, don't they? Uh, thank you very much, Annabelle. Uh, Annabelle and guests at uh, Westminster. A few other main news stories tonight, quickly. Uh, Northern Rail has been told to come up with a, an action plan to improve. After a string of delays and cancellations, Rail North, which oversees train services in the region, called emergency talks after the company issued do-not-travel warnings to passengers on Sunday due to a lack of staff. Greater Manchester's mayor questioned the firm's boss today, describing its performance as embarrassing. We've got over 1,600 cancellations across the north this week. We had a do not travel notice between English cities at the weekend, Manchester and Stoke, Manchester and Chester. They're not on. I mean, this is not uh, an acceptable uh, level of service. Chatbot versions of Brianna Jai have been found on an AI platform which allows users to create digital versions of people. Brianna, of course, was murdered by two teenagers last year. Her mother's condemned the online world as manipulative and dangerous. The platform concerned said that it deleted the chatbots after being alerted. A paraglider who went missing in the Lake District yesterday has been found injured. Mountain, uh, police and mountain rescue teams had earlier issued an appeal to find the 34-year-old from Oxfordshire, who'd told friends that he was going to paraglide as far as he could back to Grasmere from the area around Fairfield. He's now been treated in hospital. Merseyside police have made a fresh appeal for information two years after Jacqueline Rutter was shot dead at her home at Morton in Wirral. Eight suspects have been arrested, but nobody's yet been charged. Police are trying to trace three people who are thought to be involved and a black Vauxhall insignia that they are thought to have used. Right, let's have a look at sport. Richard uh, is here in the studio with us tonight. Rich, Manchester United know who they want yeah. to succeed Eric Ten Hag, but it may take a while. Yes, Rog. Ruben Amarim, as you know, uh, sporting Lisbon boss. United, we know, are willing to pay the £8.3 million release clause for him, but negotiations appear to be ongoing. There are unconfirmed reports. It's connected with compensation. The Portuguese club want to release the coaching staff that he wants to take with him. Asked last night whether he would be at United for Sunday's Premier League game against Chelsea. This is what he had to say. It's my decision. I will tell everything. Um, so we have to wait. Will you be in the dugout at Old Trafford on Sunday? I will be here. Definitely. I don't know. Cryptic. Uh, United face Leicester in the last 16 of the Carabao Cup tonight with Manchester City at Spurs. The holders Liverpool at Brighton. There's an intriguing tie as well at Deepdale where Championship side Preston North End welcome Arsenal. Anything can come from a cup game, you know. They say it could be an unbelievable night and lead to something really, really special. Likewise, if you get beat, it's done, it's over, you, but you've got to quickly move on to the next, so you can't have any hangover, so that's the best way to, to deal with it. Now to a man who's making a big name for himself in motorsport. Chris Ingram from Manchester was recently crowned British Rally Champion. He's the only British driver to have won both that prestigious title and the European crown. Chris will now have the chance to race in Japan next month in the World Championships, and as I found out today, he has his sights set on getting to the very top. Definitely not sunk in yet. It's starting to. It's uh, very proud of this achievement. It's been a tough year, a tough journey. I lost everything after becoming European champion during COVID, and after, you know I had to move back on my parents' sofa. And from from being on stage with Lewis Hamilton collecting that trophy to then um, brought right back down 
to earth. That that was a humbling experience, but it's uh, it's been the making of me really, and it's it's really driven me to to push forward and fight fight for this back and. And it's just the start. I feel we've got a, a long way to go and we can, we can go all the way. When you look at that young man lying on your, your parents' sofa, wondering whether you'd get a, a big drive again and looking at what you've achieved, what does it make you think? Just never give up on your dreams and, and fight for yourself and believe in yourself. Have you had a chance to celebrate yet or not? Uh, not yet, but we, we've got some big plans in, in store for uh, after Japan. I think I'm going to have to... Put, put focus into Japan and maybe save the celebrations for the end of the year. Well, if you're saving them up, there are going to be some celebrations, <laughs> aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. We definitely need to celebrate this one hard. Looking further forwards, Chris, what are the ambitions? Like I say, I, I, I really feel we're ready for the World Rally Championship and um, Japan's just the start. So we're hoping to secure the funding to do a full season next year. I know we can do it and it's just going to be all about proving ourselves on the world stage now to get that ultimate chance. And what would it mean to you if you could be successful at a world level? I think this is just an affirmation that we can, we can go even further and yeah, it would mean the world to, to myself, the whole team, to everyone supporting us if we can, we can go all the way and fight for the World Rally Championship. But, like I say, it's just the beginning still. British champion, European champion. I wouldn't put it past him, you know, to, uh, to do it one day. He deserves all the success he gets, uh, does Chris. A reminder, uh, just finally, that nominations for BBC Sports Personality of the Year Unsung Hero Award closes at midnight tonight. So if you know someone who goes above and beyond in your local community, you have just five hours left to nominate them. As we know, Rog, so many people doing so many amazing things in the North West. Absolutely, but time is, time is of the essence now it's if you ticking. haven't already nominated him. Chris, what a driver. Oh, he, he really is. Those pictures are just quite something. They're amazing, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Rich, thank you, as always. Uh, Richard with the sport for us tonight. We've got Abby with the weather for you uh, in just a moment. It is Halloween tomorrow, you know. Time for trick-or-treating, pumpkins and costumes. That's just the grown-ups. Um, there's an attraction in Lancashire which some of you might recognise. It's called Scare City. It's open f its doors for Halloween at the abandoned Camelot theme park at uh, Charnock Richard near Chorley. That closed 12 years ago, but it's now reopened with some seasonal sights and frights. Christine has emailed. She says we should have warned people before showing the pictures at the start of the programme. So, if you are of a nervous disposition, you may want to close your eyes. Laura O'Neill's report contains some flashing images as well. <laughs> this is Camelot, but probably not as you remember it. Go ahead! <laughs> Is there something a bit twisted about taking what is like basically a kid's theme park and turning it into... We like to think so, yeah, absolutely. The amusement park entertained audiences for nearly 30 years with shows and rides themed around the Arthurian legends before it closed in 2012 due to a decline in visitors. After lying derelict for more than a decade, the park was resurrected by the creators of Halloween attraction Scare City in 2020. <laughs> The theme park that was once home to family-friendly characters from the legend of King Arthur is now crawling with critters that would make even his bravest knights nervous. Did you know Camelot before it was this? Uh, no, actually. I'm American and Irish originally, <laughs> so kind of hanging out in Chorley now is, is a bit of a weird experience. <laughs> and the Camelot relics are still a big part of the show. We do have a, a previous Menjirana, which is now our infirmary. Yeah, the, the white tiles really help on that. We have lots of people who are kind of trying to piece together the previous theme park and lots of people who, who knew it very well. And we find mixtures of people who can absolutely do it and then people who have no idea where, we, where they are. And at that point, they then get jump scared. <laughs> So that's my favourite, when somebody thinks they know what's going to happen or thinks they know what it was and then it becomes something different. So how does it feel to be doing this in what was probably a, a theme park when you were a kid? There's a couple of like my grandparents and stuff, so you're walking around and thinking like, oh, I remember going there with Grandma and Grandad and watching the jousting and everything that was going on and 
and now Grandad's coming round to see us perform. <laughs> we still provide that entertainment service, but from a completely different angle, and we're like, actually, we're going to scare you so much that you have fun. Is it like the kids that once came to Camelot have kind of grown up and now they're here? Yeah, exactly that. And some of them you can see when they're walking around, they go, oh, I know what that is. But then you take that as an opportunity as a scare act to yourself, and you go, they're distracted, let's get them. Laura O'Neill, BBC Northwest Tonight, Chorley. Scare City. You can open your eyes again now if you did close them. Um, we'll find out about the weather, shall we? Uh, Abby is here. Um, are, you easy, are you easily scared? Do you have a nervous disposition? Yes, I would hate that. Okay. That looks awful. What about you? Uh, yeah, I could take it or leave it. <laughs> OK, I feel like we've set ourselves up for a bit of an or office <laughs> fright now, haven't we? <laughs> or um, Thankfully, the weather is nothing really too terrifying at the moment. I mean, it was quite cloudy today, wasn't it? The cloud has been quite stubborn today. So it's led to kind of misty, murky conditions, a little bit of uh, drizzle as well in places. Uh, a few Halloween uh, photos still coming in from the BBC Weather Watchers. If you would like to send a photo in to us here at Northwest tonight, uh, all the details can be found on the screen behind me very shortly. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram, you can follow me on X, for me on Twitter uh, and you can sign up to become one of our BBC Weather Watchers as well and those photos come directly into us here at Northwest tonight. So the headline for tomorrow, a really similar forecast to come, a fairly cloudy day to come, mostly dry. We've got a big area of high pressure, keeping our weather very similar, very settled, very repetitive over the next few days. But it is quite tricky to forecast exact cloud amounts when the, the pressure is this high. So it may well be that the cloud breaks a little more tomorrow and we see some brighter spells, but we could also see it thick enough for a couple of spots of drizzle, much like today. But a lot of cloud overnight tonight. And what the cloud is doing is acting as a bit of a blanket and stopping our temperatures from dropping much lower than about 9 or 10 degrees. So it will be quite a mild start to the day tomorrow. Potentially quite misty and murky in one or two places, much like the last couple of mornings. That will lift. We'll see quite a lot of low cloud once again. Thick enough in one or two spots for a couple of bits and pieces of drizzle, but nothing really that should spoil things too much if you are heading out trick or treating tomorrow evening. Temperatures 14 or 15 degrees Celsius. So it is relatively mild for the time of year at the moment. We are in this milder air mass. A slight change this weekend. Cooler air just starts to flirt with the far north of the UK, but it doesn't last long. We will then see it returning back to this warmer southerly airflow into the start of next week, and that will boost our temperatures once again. So Friday's forecast then. At the moment, a very similar day to come. A lot of cloud. The best chance of seeing any brightness will be further east. A mostly dry day, though with our temperatures once again slightly above the average, around 14 or 15 degrees. Slightly more sunshine in the forecast, I think, for the weekend, Rog. So you're not going to be all dressed up and going trick-or-treating tomorrow night, then? I mean, I've come as Wednesday Adams. It's a very good look, indeed. <laughs> Thank as you good very as it much. Gets. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. <laughs> uh, thank you for watching. Have a great evening.